welcome to this first in a series of videos from Lindsay and Billy. Hi, um, we thought this would be a nice way to help uh, continue our sense of collaborative uh, community during our distance seminar. Um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what we were seeing show up in some of the ideas uh, that you described to us in our first couple of Zoom meetings um, and uh, have a conversation among ourselves that maybe you can connect to uh, in your work as you're continuing to develop your seminar project. So we're going to start with uh, something that's familiar to most of you. Uh, this letter to the great variety of readers from Heming Van Condel at the beginning of the folio, right? Um, so Hemings and Kondo work really hard to get all of this together after Shakespeare is gone. Um, we, we all know, you know, they, they talk to actors, they get quartos, they magic it all together, right? Um, but they, they don't put it in those terms um, so much. And so if, um, if you'll allow me, I'm just going to read um, a bit of this to you. So I'm starting in the second paragraph. It had been a thing, we confess, worthy to have been wished, that the author himself had lived to set forth and overseen his own writings. But since it hath been ordained otherwise, and he by death departed from that right, we pray you do not envy his friends the office of their care and pain to have collected and published them, and so to have published them as where before, you were abused with diverse stolen and surreptitious copies, maimed and deformed by the frauds and stealths of injurious impostors that exposed them. Even those are now offered to your view, cured and perfect of their limbs, and all the rest absolute in their numbers as he conceived them. So Hemings and Condell don't say, you know, these are true and perfect copies, right? They say these other copies were maimed imperfect. These have been cured by the folio and being put together in this sort of editorial commemorative process. And so that's where we'd like to begin our chat today about disability and even more than that ability in these plays and other texts in the early modern period. Um, as we mentioned in our first couple of conversations, um, one of the things that uh, we're thinking about, uh, that we're hoping to try and come up with over the course of the seminar uh, is a, a term to describe um, early modern ability. Um, and uh, we don't know yet what term we're going to settle on. We think that's a, that's a collective work we'll do together, whether that be ability or normalcy or able-bodiedness or something else. Um, but we, um, more than needing you to come up with a term right now, we really want to encourage you to think about um, putting visibility on, making more visible um, the qualities of able-bodiedness, early modern able-bodiedness that you see arising in the text that you look at. I think it would be really easy to look at that folio letter and focus exclusively on the um, presentation of the bad quartos as disabled. Um, and mm -hmm. that needs to be done. But I think it is just as um, important and just as illuminating to, to look at what uh, the editors say about the perfected, right, the cured uh, mm -hmm. folio text. I was even really struck by the way they describe themselves uh, as um, operating out of the office of their care and pain, like that that's how they describe the process of curing. Um, and their job as healers or physicians or something else entirely, right? Like they, they don't 
use medical words themselves. Like how are they figuring themselves? So, so I think that, that considering those like mirror images of ability are gonna be really necessary as we continue to further understand early modern disability. Um, and um, so we, we wanted to, to remind you that that's really the focus of our seminar, that we're, we're trying to um, understand that more fully. And we want you to at least consider how that um, operates in your own seminar work. Um, we are not asking you to like rework your project. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> we love the project you outlined. Yeah, just add um, you know, a little bit about yeah. the way that the way that disability and ability work to put each other into relief, right? Yeah. To mm -hmm. to emphasize one or the other, um, and we we heard a lot of that in your plans too for um, for your papers. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. We did, um, and that's what we want to talk about today a little bit is a couple of places where we saw that um, really coming through and where we can see more places of connection with those things. So um, one place that really stood out to me, because this is what I am always reading for, is um, the, the uh, several of you who were thinking about performance and disability performance. Um, and there are sort of multiple valences to how that might, um, uh, how, a, how a focus on ability or at least a, 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 an examination of ability could further elucidate uh, those discussions. Um, <clears throat> I was really uh, struck, I think this is especially true of Nicole's paper on fools um, and thinking about virtuosity as a necessary part of disability performance that both um, seems to contradict the idea of um, disability, right? We, we think of virtuosity as a, a quality of skill and craft um, associated with ability, uh, at least in early modern terms. Uh, and maybe we need to rethink that, but um, that, <clears throat> excuse me, that was a place um, but I, I think there are a number of ways in which considering performance, um, especially in terms of the able-bodied actor who is taking on the performance of disability, although are we assuming that the actor is able-bodied when maybe we shouldn't, um, uh, but also, um, this is me like having like 15 ideas about, <laughs> about performance and, and ability, um, the ways in which we see ability performed just as we see disability performed. Um, what does it look like for an actor to stage ability? Um, is it strength? Is it beauty? Is it wholeness? Um, is it wit? Like how, how do we see those performances illuminating and inflecting the performances of ability we also see. I mean, like, I think about this with Richard III all the time. Everybody wants to talk about disability in Richard III and talk about how Richard is performed. I think it is just as important to think about um, how Richmond is performed. Like, I, I think Richmond often becomes this, like, um, cartoon of heroicness that is absolutely uh, about his physical body. Um, and I think you could think about that in the text. And I think thinking about that would be an important way to understand how disability is operating in that play. Um, and and uh, there are a thousand versions of that, right? Like every, you, you could do that with any character really. Um, and so those of you who are thinking about disabled performance, I, I would encourage you to also think about how able-bodied performance um, works in tandem. Um, in the text that you're examining. Absolutely. And what you just said about Richmond reminds me of a non-Shakespearean play uh, that I'm going to pull into our conversation and that's Tamburlaine, right? Yeah. Um, so Christopher Marlowe's Tamburlaine um, is, as most of you probably know, right? This, this play about this hyper-able conqueror, right? 
But in like real life, in the historical record, Tamerlane was disabled. His very like, his name comes from Timur the Lame because he had like a accounts vary, right? Um, but he had he had a disability that affected his walk, um, his gait. And so um, Marlowe's Tamerlane is not disabled. Um, but one of the things that I'm working on is thinking about how language in the in the play um, and poetry in the play sort of takes the place of disability in some places. Um, and so um, so I'm this this sort of segues us into the other sort of grouping of papers um, that um, that you have spoken about um, having to do with language or prosody in um, and ability and disability. Um, and so there are lots of different ways to think about language. We can think of it as just communication, right? We can think of it as form and sense. Um, we can also just think about versification, accent meter, things like that. Um, it's uh, several, several of you are looking at places where um, language might seem to break down or silences in a play. Um, and it's important to see um, to see silence as um, a record of something rather than just a blank, right? Um, and that's that's part of what we're doing and excavating disability in the early modern period too, right? Um, and why this focus on ability is is so crucial, we think, to the work of pre-modern disability studies, um, because disability is being shaped and formed by conceptions of ability. And so um, thinking of like what it means for a speech to be perfectly iambic, right? Um, what, it, what it means when somebody switches to prose in the middle of something, is that a mark of ability? You know, we talk about that in terms of, in terms of characters anyway, right? Um, what might it say about the writers and the readers? Right, this this focus on ability and um, uh, corrected or cured um, text that Hemming and Condell pick up, um, I think is I think is something that's really a not a specter that seems yeah. nefarious, but um, yeah. some a presence um, in in our in our uh, in our seminar. Um, and that and that delights me. This overlap between the body of work that a poet or playwright produces, their corpus, right, mm -hmm. and their actual body, um, our conception of Shakespeare as this hyper able writer who can write King Lear in a pandemic, right? Um, is, is, I think, is I think really connected to, um, to this way that um, the, the editors of the folio set up these texts themselves as, if not hyper able, then at least cured, right? They're the right thing that we should be reading, not this, not this trash you have before. Um, so, uh, so, so, I'm, so I'm really interested in, in the way that you're all, in the way that you're all thinking of that as well. Um, Nick is thinking about how madness might be portrayed. And I'm, I'm, I have a hunch that some of that might be based in language too, right? Um, Ophelia, for instance, her meter is all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, I'm, I'm sure there. I'm sure there are others as well. Um, the way that the way that the witches speak in Macbeth, right? And um, that's that's not necessarily disability. It's differing, right, from the norm of the play. Um, but their their speech is wildly different than everything else. And so that's that's something to think about and push toward. I think in making this ability stuff more visible, making it something more conspicuous um, right yeah and I think looking at ability is also one of the ways in which we can better see places where um, the disabled able-bodied binary cracks right or, yes. or where bodies slip the binary um, I was thinking about Kasha's project on pregnancy and how pregnant bodies in the early modern period are simultaneously hyper able, right, to their ability yeah. to be fertile. 
um, at a time when fertility is the norm, right, or is regarded as the norm, and uh, infertility uh, is is regarded as a form of disability in certain people at certain times. Um, uh, but yet simultaneously, um, pr pregnancy and pregnant bodies are, are seen as, as atypical, as disabled in a number of ways. And so like, I, I think that drawing our attention to the, the constructions of ability, as we also look at constructions of disability are really important for helping us understand um, how those categories did not fit and how those categories fail and fracture. Um, and uh, and of course, it's in those fractured places um, that there is uh, so much hope, right, for for rewriting and reunderstanding and reconceptualizing what disability is and means um, even now. So um, that's just our reminder and some thoughts about uh, where we're headed. Um, Speaking of places where we're headed, the next place we're headed is the website. <laughs> so if you haven't already signed up for an account on our seminar website, um, a reminder about how to do that will be sent to you along with this video. Um, and um, you should sign up because um, we've, we've got an assignment coming up. We've got a blog post to write. Um, we've suggested approximately a thousand words, but you do you, right? Um, and uh, this this blog post is um, is meant to be um, a sort of meditation on the work that you plan to do for the seminar and how it might fit into um, some of these the fractures that that Lindsay was just talking about. Some of the spaces between or um, the the you know how it how it might set disability in relief with ability. Um, we are already so grateful for the work you've been doing um, and for your willingness to jump into this kind of um, odd variation of the SIA seminar with us. Um, so thank you for what you've already done. We're excited to see things going forward. If you ever want to talk to either one or both of us about things you're thinking about, we would love that. Um, but uh, thank you especially for taking up this during uh, just a terrible time, just a deeply bad time. Uh, we know that the cost of uh, doing uh, any auxiliary work right now is, is really high and um, we're grateful for that. Yes, honored, thank you. Um, and we look forward to interacting with your work and with your blog posts. Um, and I think we'll, I think we'll be writing too, not just replying, but, you know, thinking through issues ourselves as well. Um, so sign up for the website, mm -hmm. um, look for reminders from us about upcoming dates and things to consider. Um, we'll also be asking for your mailing address because we have something cooked up for you all. So um, that'll, that'll all be coming up soon. So we're excited. Things to look forward to. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.